Hey everybody and welcome back to Investing with Wesley and welcome back to this series that I'm doing where I'm teaching you exactly how the economy works. In the last episode I told you that the central bank was one of the most important players in this economic machine because it regulates and controls the most important aspect of the economy. That aspect being credit. In today's episode we're going to dive a little bit deeper into everything the central bank does how important credit really is and how much credit there really is in the economy right now, and then finish off with the different cycles. So with that being said, let's get into it. Okay, so you already know that the central bank controls the amount of available credit and the amount of money that's in the economy right now. But what a lot of people don't understand is there is a huge difference between actual money and credit. And that what most people consider money is actually credit in the economy circulating around. Now, I know that's kind of confusing, and to be honest, credit is probably the most misunderstood part of the entire economy. Because a dollar worth of credit and a dollar worth of real money is still a dollar each way. But what I mean when I say there's a lot more credit in the economy than there is actual money is because money is something that we use to settle the transactions that we purchase. Now, those transactions could just be you using money to buy something that is going to enhance your business or make you more productive, or that could be money you're using to settle a transaction with a loan or a debt instrument that you got. At its most basic form, credit is created out of thin air just when two different people agree to accept payment a little bit later. Two easy examples are you can go to a bar and order a drink and open up a tab. You're agreeing that you're gonna pay that tab in full later into the future. Or you can go to a restaurant and order food. And only after your food has been served and you eat it do you normally pay for that bill. Now admittedly, both those credits that you create are really short term and are typically settled and paid for just hours after agreeing to these terms. Whereas in the economy, credit is extended a lot longer than just a couple hours. Think of mortgages, they extend all the way to 30 years. And with refinancing, you can extend 30 into 60 or even 90 years, depending on when you refinance. But it doesn't matter how long the agreement is or how long the terms are when creating credit or using credit. What matters is that by overspending today by using credit, you're guaranteeing that at some point in the future, you're going to have to spend less than you're earning to pay that bill back and settle that transaction. Now, you might be wondering yourself, well, why would anyone even agree to use credit in the economy like this? And that's because it increases spending, which stimulates the growth of the economy. Remember in the last episode where I talked to you all about transactions, one person's spending is another person's income. So if we can use credit to increase someone's spending, then that will increase someone else's income, which in turn will increase their spending and so on and so forth. And the whole machine ticks upward more and more and more and it's a big feedback loop. Now again, we're gonna take these two main points. The first point is that every dollar spent is someone else's income. The second point is that by using credit, you're overspending and drawing from the future dollars you're gonna be earning. Again, guaranteeing that at some point in the future, you're going to have to spend less in order to pay that money back. These two fundamental principles come together to create our short-term and long-term debt cycle. At the end of the day, the most important aspect to the economy is productivity growth. That as a whole is what drives our entire economy and it remains a constant and hardly fluctuates which also unfortunately makes it not as influential as let's say credit. You could have all the credit in the world, but if you're not actually being more productive and growing, then your standard of living doesn't get any better with time and you remain stagnant. That is why productivity growth is the overall most important. But again, it doesn't really play a huge driver in the economy because we have credit and because credit is so volatile and can be used so powerfully. Again, using debt allows us to spend more than we earn today. Now, for the most part, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It only becomes a bad thing when we overspend on consumerism without having the ability to grow our income and pay those things back. Buying brand new cars or a brand new TV on credit isn't really the best option to do because it doesn't produce you more income. However, if you're a mechanic, you might be able to use credit to purchase power tools instead of hand tools just to increase your productivity and repair these vehicles faster. One is overspending on consumerism. The other one is overspending in order to increase your productivity and thus also increase your income. One, you won't be able to pay back in the long run. 
the other will grow your income to help you pay it back in the future. But again, whenever you're using debt or whenever you're using credit, you're guaranteeing that at some point in the future, you have to spend less in order to pay that money back. And it's exactly this overspend and underspend that creates the two cycles. The short-term debt cycle, which lasts anywhere from five to eight years on average, and then the long-term debt cycle, which usually lasts about 75 to 100 years. Now, the good thing about these cycles is that once you understand them and understand how they work, they actually make it really easy to calculate and predict certain events that are going to happen in the economy in the future. Now, it's not a perfect system. No one has a crystal ball, but you will be able to pick up on all the warning signs out in the market and be able to deduce and calculate what you should actually do about them, whether it's extra diversification or to sell now and collect all of your profits, so on and so forth. So now that you understand money settles transaction, we can create credit out of thin air and that because of credit, it creates these cycles that allow us to overspend now to underspend later. Let's talk about how all of that fits in to the central bank. The central bank's primary job is to regulate the amount of credit that is in the economy. And you might be thinking, why is that even necessary? Well, and that's because if we continue to borrow, continue to overspend, and even if it's in the right way of productivity growth, that also creates inflation. Inflation is caused when prices and incomes rise faster than the productivity growth that's behind it. A good example is what we're seeing in America right now. Because of the pandemic and everything was on shutdown, there is a bunch of pent up demand and there was hardly any little productivity. Because of all the demand and because of such little productivity, we are now experiencing the effects of inflation. Now this inflation is only exacerbated by the trillions of dollars that the Federal Reserve printed and put into the market itself, but we'll get more into that on a later episode. Let's just assume for one second that the Federal Reserve never printed money in 2020. We would still be feeling the effects of inflation because of it. It just wouldn't be nearly as severe as it is now. But anyway, inflation's bad. We all know this. And the central bank's in charge of regulating the amount of inflation in the market. If we just left it to continue to borrow and feed amongst itself and grow and grow and grow, the inflation would eventually just get way out of hand. So in order to combat inflation, the central bank raises and lowers interest rates. And this whole thing is a balancing act that the central bank tries to do in order to maintain the growth of the economy in an easy way, but also protect it from runaway inflation. So let's talk about how they do this. Well, the primary function is raising and lower interest rates. If interest rates are low, then that stimulates the economy because it makes it easier and cheaper to borrow money. If it's cheaper to borrow money, then that means it's easier to borrow money. And in turn, borrowed money means more spending. So it stimulates the economy in an upward direction. But if inflation turns out to be an issue, then they'll raise interest rates. And when you raise interest rates, it's no longer as easy to borrow money because it's more expensive to pay that back. So obviously this would create less borrowing, which means less spending. And since that spending is someone else's income, incomes go down, which means even less borrowing and less spending. And the whole cycle turns against itself and starts heading down. Now, like I said, this is a balancing act that the central bank has to do because too low of interest rates for too long creates runaway inflation. But if you raise the interest rates for too long, then that will create deflation because people stop spending as much money and prices go down. Both inflation and deflation is bad and we don't want it. But the heightened risk of raising interest rates is that if the economy struggles too much to grow because it's too hard to borrow money, then economic activity decreases. And if it decreases long enough, then we enter in what's called a recession. And again, it's a balancing act. When a recession becomes too severe, the central bank will lower interest rates, thus stimulating the economy, pulling it out of the recession and beginning that expansion phase yet again. What I just described to you is how the short-term debt cycle functions. In the next episode, we're gonna go in deeper on the short-term and long-term debt cycle. But for now, that's all the time I have. I hope we got value in this video. If you did, please remember to like and subscribe as it really helps this channel grow. If you ever had a question, comment, or just wanted something addressed, feel free to message me on either my dedicated Instagram or Facebook account. Either way though, the choice is yours and I'll see you in the next episode.